Well, that was an interesting warm-up for our Bible study tonight. I like when we get a chance to do that. And uh, although it is the longest chapter in the Bible, I have been very kind and, uh, and chopped it into many, 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 many pieces. So um, tonight we'll be looking at verses 1 through verse 16 in Psalm 119, again, the longest chapter in the Bible. And uh, before we do that, please join me in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for this fellowship and for already the time that we spent together tonight has been fruitful in our conversation we had before we've even gotten to study your word. But may you help us as we study your word tonight to gain knowledge and understanding and wisdom in it. Uh, Help us to be encouraged by it, convicted by it, changed by it. Especially tonight because your word that we're studying tonight is about your word. And so, Lord, uh, bless our time together in your word, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This is, uh, like I said, this is uh, a chapter that is heavy on the Bible, on God's word. And you'll see that as we're going through this. Um, You're also going to see a few other things that are unique to this psalm. Um, It will be definitely exalting God's word. That's, That's one way you could summarize this psalm. Uh, when we get through it. But I think it's just, it's so rich and there's so much going on with it and it's so conversation worthy that we're going to do smaller bits to make that more likely instead of trying to take huge chunks and push through them. So um, with that in mind, we'll start by looking at the subtitle which says, Your Word is a Lamp to My Feet. Whose word is the psalm writer talking about? God's word, yeah. So God's word is a lamp unto my feet. And then we have Aleph is a word there. We'll, we'll get to what that's about here afterwards. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. Then we have another section entitled Beth. It goes to verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches." I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. All right. Those are, that is not all of Psalm 119. There's 176 verses in Psalm 119. So yes, this is just a tiny little sliver of pie of uh, Psalm 119. So we'll take this uh, in those little bits like that. Again, I remind you, as we're going through this, if you have questions or thoughts, to please share them. And uh, let's start with question one. What's the meaning of the names before each separate section of Psalm 119? Tonight we only saw two of them, Aleph and Beth. Is it numbers? It's not numbers. Well, you're close. It's not numbers, though. I thought they were the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Alphabet, yes. This is the Hebrew alphabet. These are, these are the names of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet in which there are 22 letters. So guess how many sections there are, not verses, but sections there are in Psalm 119? 22. 22. Very good. Very good. This is called a, an acrostic. This type of psalm is called an acrostic. So when, they, when each section is started with a letter of the alphabet and it goes in order from the first to the last. So that's what that's all about. So when you see those, those are just the names of the letters of the alphabet. So each stanza is going to have that that different name 
on the top of it, and that name is just the name of the alphabetical letter, and it goes in order from the first to the 22nd. Make sense? Yes. Great. Great. All right. Uh, question two, what does the subtitle, your word is a lamp to my feet, mean? So if, if, if somebody says to you, hey, I want to encourage you today. Okay, how, how, how would you like to do that? And they say, the, the, God's word is a lamp unto your feet. What, what are they trying to tell you? What does that mean? That God's word is a lamp unto my feet. You won't stumble because you'll, have, you'll see where you're going. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's a source of Life. light. And that light allows you to be able to see where you're going so you don't stumble in the dark. Right. The world is dark. Uh, there's also, you know, symbolically, light equals a five-letter word that starts with true and ends in uth. Truth. Truth. Thank you. Yes. True. Yes. Very good. Very good. You guys haven't lost a beat. You guys haven't lost a beat. I am so happy. So if I want to, if I want, God's, God's word is light. It's a lamp which gives off light. So God's word is truth because it's light. And God's word is not only light, it's truth, and that allows me to see where I'm going and to be walking rightly. So I'm going in the right direction because I can see where I'm going. And I'm walking or living out my faith rightly that way. So if I want to if I want to know which way to walk and I want to know which way to go safely in this dark world, I can look to God's word, which is a lamp. A lamp unto my feet, a lamp unto my walk. And walk is just your daily life, living rightly. Not living rightly according to you, by the way, or according to me, but according to God. Very good. Okay, question three. Read verses one through three. Okay. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. Who's being described in those verses? Believers? believers? Yeah. Real believers, right? In the context of what we've read so far, these would be, and, and again, all we've read so far is the subtitle and the first three verses. But in the, in the context of what we've read so far, these are believers who are putting their faith and trust in God's word, which is a lamp unto their feet, right? So definitely that's who's being described here. The reason I'm highlighting that is because I don't want to give people the impression that, well, if you just believe that Jesus is, that's describing anybody who just believes Jesus is. Well, demons believe that Jesus is. Exactly. Verses 1 through 3 are not referring to demons. Exactly. So it's referring to people who not only believe who Jesus is, but believe and put their faith and trust in the Word of God. So that's, that's the idea there. And plus, in Psalms, they, Jesus' name wasn't known yet. Right? It was just Messiah or Savior or the Lord. So we understand who's being described here. What about how do such people act according to these verses? Uh, verse 1, how, do, how does somebody who is a genuine believer in God and in his word, how do they act? Uh, they're, they're what? What's the, well, first off, what's the first word? Blessed. They're blessed, right? So first off, they're blessed. And, it's, and they're, how else do they act? You had it right when I interrupted you. Their way is blameless. Their way is blameless. Does that mean perfect life? I mean... Can you live a perfect life? No. no. No, you can't. That's why Jesus had to come and live the perfect life that you and I could not. If anyone could live a perfect life, there's no need for Jesus to come. So then it's because then it's just a matter of, well, you just need to try hard enough. Just enough elbow grease, spit, and determination, right? That's all you need. Well, no, it's impossible. So we have to keep that in the back of your mind because there's more here that kind of deals with that. So let's flush that out as we move on. There's also another thing, according to you, they, they walk in the what? They walk in the, in the what of the Lord? In the law of the Lord, which is another way of saying what? They walk according to God's word. His law is his word because his word is law. It's not, it's not God's word is suggestive. 
You know, it's just if, you, if you'd like, or if you kind of don't mind. You know, his word is commands. His, his word is law. Verse 2 says, blessed are those who do what? Keep, keep what? His testimonies. His testimonies. <clears throat> Keeps his ways is another way of thinking of that. His testimonies, God's testimony is another word for his, his word. And his word is his way. They're also going to be seeking God with what? Their whole heart. Their whole heart. Have you ever seeked God with your whole heart? Now, here's, here's a point that kind of ties to that blameless part that we mentioned just a little bit ago. None of us are completely blameless, right? None of us live a sin-free life. Christ did on our behalf, and we put our faith in his sinless life for our salvation and our righteousness. So in the same way, I ask you, has any of us been able to seek God with our whole heart? 100%. Every beat of your heart. No. I would say no. No. Now, here's the distinction. Everything requires explanation, doesn't it? Right? Oh, this is what you have to do. You have to do this. Okay, so you and I will worship God and will serve him in heaven 100% with your entire heart, your whole being. That will absolutely happen in heaven. You will worship him in the fullest sense with your whole heart. But that particular way of worshiping him and serving him with your whole heart can't and won't happen till heaven when he's perfected you. Yes. Now, there's that side of the, of, the, of the Jordan. Now, on this side of the Jordan, you can serve God and you can seek God with your heart, but you only have so much heart that you can give. You're going to have a whole lot more in fullness on the other side of heaven. But here on this earth, you only have so much. So then it's a matter of they are seeking after God with their whole heart that is available yes. at the time. That's the idea. It's not calling for a perfect, full heart being devoted. It's what I've got, which ain't much. I don't have a lot. I am not, I am not who I will be. But what I have, I want. What I have wants God. What I have is seeking after him. That's what this means. So there's two types of whole heart, right? There's the, the pre-perfection, which is what I just got done describing, and then there's the, the after heaven. When, yeah, you finally will 100% be able to worship him and seek after him with your whole heart. That, at that point, hope has been realized. That hope of, of, of fullness in the whole heart being devoted towards him, is, that's finally realized in heaven. That's why, if you ever wonder why it says faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love, that the reason why love is the greatest over hope and faith is because faith is realized in heaven. When Jesus is standing right before you, your faith has been realized. It's no longer faith, right? Faith is having faith in, or trusting in what is unseen. Well, once you see him, it's no longer faith. You've, you, it's been realized. Hope is the same way. Your hope has been fulfilled when you're in heaven. There's no more hope because every you've cashed in the hope has been realized but love well, love continues on in heaven which is why it's considered the greatest and you will love him and seek him with your whole heart in a whole perfect way in heaven but there's another way of thinking about that here on earth does that make sense all right what about uh, verse three who also do know but walk in his so those who do no wrong, but walk in his ways. Now, this is another example of, can any of us say, uh, raise your hand if you do no wrong. None of us can say that, right? And, and how many of us can, can walk perfectly in his ways? Well, no, it's not talking about this. It's the desire. That's the desire. I, I want to walk in his ways. I want to honor him. I want, this is talking more about the pattern of someone's life not the perfect walk and it, it irritates me sometimes because the the lack of of going into just a little bit more of a description of that makes it possible for people outside of the church to say oh you holy rollers oh you self-righteous hypocrites oh you people who think you're holier than thou right because 
They read scripture like this or hear scripture like this or hear us use the terminology blameless, uh, do no wrong, righteous, right? And they're not understanding it in the way that what we're meaning by those terms. So you have to make sure that you not only understand that yourself, but then remember when you're talking to someone else that you must make these distinctions or else they're going to assume that when you say, well, I walk in the way of the Lord, I am uh, doing no wrong. I keep his testimonies. I seek him with my whole heart. Uh, did I mention I do no wrong and that I walk in his ways? I mean, who wants to be around a person like that? Instead, you say, you talk about these things, you say, this is, this is who I am now in not in perfection. This is what I desire. This is how Christ has transformed me. God has transformed me. Now I desire these things and I, and I do them imperfectly. But one day, thanks to God, I will be able to do these things perfectly. But only because of him. Now, oh, that changes things. Wait a minute, this is now a humble person that I'm talking to. Oh, this is a person who's giving all the glory to Christ and to God, not, not to themselves. That's... That's what we have to do with text like this. Any questions on verses 1 through 3? All right, question 4. What does God command in verse 4? And what does verse 5 mean? Let's read those. It says in verse 4, You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. And verse 5 says, Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. So, verse 4 says, you have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. What does that mean? What is God commanding those who seek after him, those who desire him? He, he, this is what he's saying to those people, right? The context hasn't changed. Keep the, law. Keep the law. Do what I say. Follow my commands. Know them. Inspect them. Know them. Do them. Inspect them. Know them. Do them. Keep it uh, kindly, or you need to do this every once in a while, or what's a word that starts with dill and ends in? Thank you. Keep it diligently. That takes effort. Keep it diligently. It doesn't say, um, you, have, uh, you have commanded your precepts so that when I'm walking down the street, one might bump into me by accident now and again. No. You are to be keeping his precepts or his commands or his word diligently. That takes effort. Somebody says, oh, you're really diligent. Well, you know that you've had to, you, you have put forth effort. You've put what you're doing right now, studying God's word with me, is diligently seeking his word, seeking his statutes and his precepts, and looking to keep, you're doing that so that you can keep them. Now, you're going to be able to keep them perfectly? No. 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 Yeah. What are precepts? Commands. Law. Commands. Yep. Okay. Precepts, statutes, commands. All of that is referring to the Word of God. Okay. So the entire Bible, from cover to cover, well, I shouldn't say it, from Genesis to Revelation, some, some stuff has some weird stuff inside the cover, and you don't need to know what the editor said about this. Right? So, so all of God's Word from Genesis to Revelation. See how, see how very particular I am? And how particular you have to be. But everything in God's word from Genesis to Revelation is all his commands, his precepts, his statutes, his law, his word. All of it. So that's what we're to seek. That's what we're to diligently keep is all of it. Now verse 5 says, Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Now we just described along with precepts and commands what statutes means. So what's verse 5? What's the, what's the psalmist saying in verse 5? Oh, let my ways... Yeah. What, what does that sound like in our modern day language? If you, it's basically a prayer, right? Or a desire. So what's that sound like in our modern day? Most of us are not going to say, Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes, O Lord. Right? Thou hast... You know, do you pray like that? Thou hast, thee shall, though thee... Uh, steadfast in keeping your statutes. That's not how, how you pray today, or that's not how you're going to express the sentiment today. So, <laughs> so how, would you, how would you express your, this same sentiment in today's language? So that we may be faithful in keeping your 
Yes. Oh, that I might be faithful. Oh, that I might be obedient to your laws, to your word. Oh, isn't that what you desire? Yeah. Oh, yes. It does connect to on an emotional level, doesn't it? If I did, if if we just said, um, "May my ways be steadfast in keeping your statutes," well, it means the same thing. But there's an emotion there, a desire that is expressed in that two letters in that O. O H. Oh, you can almost like I, I can I can remember many times where I've been on my knees or where I've been praying. I'm like, "Oh Lord," you know, and it's just. It just is expressing that deep desire. And so it helps us to, uh, that's why a lot of people like the Psalms because it's, it's easy to, to relate to them. When you hear somebody writing like this, you're like, yeah, I get it. I've said the O's before. Oh, very good. All right, question six or five. What does verse six mean? So I've got to remember what we just read. I'm going, to, I'm going to read verses 4 and 5, and then I'll read verse 6, okay? Because I want you to remember what was just said. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. So, now, having remembered what was said in verses 4 and 5, you can answer question Five, which says, what's verse 6 mean? Well, to know what verse 6 means, you've got to go to verse 4 and 5. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. Then I shall not be put to shame. Okay, so what do I have to do to not be put to shame? I have to go to the verse before. I need to keep my ways steadfast in keeping his statutes. I need to... He's commanded his precepts to be kept diligently. I need to keep my ways steadfast in keeping them. And if I do, that's where verse 6 comes in. If I do that, then I shall not be put to shame. That's a promise. That is a promise. I will not be put to shame because I have fixed my eyes on God's commandments. This isn't just the Ten Commandments. This is all of his word. This is all of his word. All of his precepts. All of his commands. All of his statutes. All right. I, I, I don't know if I'm spacing out or whatever, but could you, could you go over that one more time? Sure. I mean, it's like I was really listening, and I'm just like, <laughs> why am I not making this connection here? I heard, I heard like a flickering of a bulb. You know, oh, yeah. So. It was a flickering <laughs> All right. So, so verse, question five says, what does verse six mean? Right? Okay. Then I shall not be put to shame, having fixed my, or my eyes fixed on all your commandments. So there's a, then means if I do what comes before this, then this will happen. So we're asking the question, if I shall not be put to shame, then I shall not be put to shame. Well, how? Well, we go to verse 5. Well, 4 and 5. So let me just read them all three together, and I'll just explain it in order. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. You have commanded God for your word to be kept. You speak it, you reveal it, you expect it to be kept. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Oh, Lord, that I could do that. Oh, Lord, that you will help me do that. Verse 6. Then, in other words, if I do that, if you help me do that, then I shall not be put to shame because I've kept your statutes, because I've kept your law, because I've kept your word. So it's because of the faithfulness, then. Uh, you're overthinking. Why am I, yeah, you're overthinking it. It's just, I, it's how am I not put to shame, verse 6? Because I'm following the statute. Because of verse 5, that I have been steadfast in keeping his word. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> That's what we do here. That's what we do here. <laughs> I went through all of Psalm 119, and all I got was this lousy t shirt and a bunch of exegesis and a <laughs> bunch of hermeneutics. <laughs> Who could ask for more? We should do like a, there should be like a is it Motel Eight or Super Eight that says we'll keep the light on for you? There should there's a there's definitely there's a yeah that's what it is. It'd be you know like uh, RFC Bible studies. We'll turn the light on for you. <laughs> With what scripture means. So does that make sense for verse six then? Yeah. 
So, hey, if you, if you keep God's commandments, meaning his word, not just the Ten Commandments, but all of his word, well, then you won't be put to shame because you have had your eyes fixed on all of his word, all of his commandments. Question six. According to verses seven and eight, what happens when the psalmist learns God's word? It says in verse seven, I will praise you. And he's not just going to praise him. He's going to praise him with a what kind of heart? Upright. An upright heart. And, and why did I phrase it the way I did in the question? According to verses 7 and 8, what happens when a psalmist learns God's word? Here's why. When I learn your righteous rules. So verse 7 says, I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. Righteous rules is another word for guess what? The b -b -b God's law, which is another word for what? The b -b -b Bible. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes. So God's commandments, God's laws, God, God's righteous rules, all is referring to the one thing I said that it is going to be lifted up in this psalm, the Bible, right? The B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. The B-I-B-L-E. Oh, and I mean, how many parts of this are still to go, Bob? I tell you. That song you were singing, when Joey was little, he's probably about three or four. And my daughter has a video, and he's in the shower, and she's standing in, in, in there, and he's just screaming this song. He loved this song. Oh, there you go. Then he used to go up and down the street telling everybody about Jesus. Oh. What? He doesn't do that now. He's 18, and he's saying Well, let's pray that, that uh, God will bring that back around, boomerang style. Yes. So what happens when the psalmist learns God's word? He does what? He praises God, right? He does so with a what kind of heart? So learning God's word will give you uh, the ability to praise God and to do so with an upright heart. Not a perfect heart, but a heart that has been made uh, clean because of the righteousness of faith in Christ, right? And faith in God. That's another thing that we always have to be careful of. We're here in the Psalms. All right, the psalmist isn't thinking about faith in Christ. He's thinking about faith in God, which revealed in the fullness of scripture and time is faith in Christ who is God. So we're going to keep kind of mentioning both back and forth so that we understand the connection there. So when I learned your righteous rules, I praise you with an upright heart. And then verse eight, I will keep your statutes. Statute. So when you learn uh, God's word, it helps you to be able to keep it. I'm going to give thanks to you. Don't, the, and, and it's also, <laughs> here's the cool part, okay? When you read verse 8, I will keep your statutes, semicolon, do not utterly forsake me. There's the humble part. There's the part that makes you understand and that clearly shows that the psalmist does not think they're righteous in and of themselves, that the psalmist does not think that their upright heart is in and of themselves, Okay? They're reading God's word, and in reading God's word, they are seeing that by God, you can have an upright heart and be righteous by and through God's work, not your work, which is why we praise him. And he's able to then keep, have us keep his word, keep his statutes, and then do not, do not forsake me. I need your, there is such a, a, a wide gap between me and you, God, that I need your help to not forsake you. You have revealed yourself to, your, to, to me in your word, and you have shown me who I really am in your word, and it shows me there's this huge gulf between us. I can't do this without you. Do not forsake me. Do you see the humility in that? And do you see the praise in that? Do not forsake me. Me. Do not utterly forsake me, which means, which means I am utterly dependent upon you, God. Which is the proper result when you are going through God's word rightly. You're going through God's word and interpreting it rightly. You will come to the conclusion that I should praise God because he is the reason that my heart has been changed and is yes. desiring to be upright and will be made upright. He's the one who's going to give me an affection and a desire to keep his righteous rules. He's the one who's going to help me keep his statutes. And because I realize that it's all because of him, this is why I beg him to not utterly forsake me because I realize it's all 
because of him. My dependence is 100% on him. Pretty good, eh? A little Canadian came out there. <laughs> Sorry about that. A little Canadian came out. Won't happen again, won't happen again. <laughs> uh, question seven. What does verse nine mean? How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. Uh, 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 you can take this verse and, and just pull it out by itself and it's self-contained. And then you can put it right back here in context and it works in context too. So it's asking a question, right? I mean, there's a question right after the word pure. So the psalmist says, how can a young man keep his way pure? Uh, this could be uh, referring to the psalmist himself, which is why it's referencing a young man. Right? Instead of anybody. Because this works for anybody. Young man, old man, old woman, young woman. Right, this, this applies to all ages. So the reason why young man, it's not, oh, this only applies to young men. It could just be a hint as to who the, the psalmist is. okay? But this applies to everyone of every age, man or woman. So how can a person keep their way pure? And the answer comes immediately after that. You could also rephrase it this way. How can, a, how can a person keep from sinning? Because that's to keep your way pure is to not sin, right? Yes. Have you ever asked yourself this question? I can't stop sinning. How am I supposed to keep myself from sinning? Or if you have a, a reoccurring sin, how am I supposed to battle this sin? How am I supposed to battle this temptation? How am I supposed to be pure? Don't you want to be pure? Don't you long to be pure? Yes, of course you do. That longing came from God who put it in you. Yes. And so the answer is, how does somebody keep from sinning? How does someone keep their way pure? The answer comes right in the second half of verse 9. By guarding your way according to whose word? According to God's word. By guiding your way by and through God's word. And in other words... Is when sin comes upon you, when sin is tempting you, when sin is at the door, then you use what to fight against it? God's word. God's word. You could totally zone out. And if I ask a question, chances are, if you shout out God's word and you haven't even been listening, that you'll at least be partially right in this whole psalm, okay? And I don't, I'm not encouraging you to zone out. Just saying. <laughs> That is a frequent answer to many of these questions, okay? God's word. So how having God's word in here and in here, in your head and in your heart, is, is what God himself prescribes for fighting against sin and keeping pure. So knowing God's word, having God's word inside of you. Now, that might be the most important verse that you hear tonight. Does anybody find reading God's word uh, boring, no. laborious? No. Many people do. That's one of the biggest complaints that I will hear, not talking about people in church here, but people outside of our church um, or people that I've known in my past. Ah, you know, I wish I was interested in it. I'm just not, right? That's well, if you're, because they don't understand. That's part of it, yeah. absolutely. So it was, that's the way I used to be because I would read it and I would think, And then when I got the NASB, mm -hmm. and I started going through the, I read the whole Old Testament, and it was like, I just couldn't get it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Except for the one. I say there's just, parts of it that yeah, are. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 <laughs> or like when they're going through and describing every, like all the. the I don't know, like, is it Leviticus or something? Yeah, the testimony of the, of yeah, those. when you have the genealogies. Yeah. yeah. yeah like, those could be, I can see where so, somebody could yeah. say that's boring. Yeah, but. so, so sure, some parts of the Bible are more exciting, like the genealogies are so exciting. I'm just kidding. Okay. I know that those are more laborious, right? But the reason I ask that is because I think some people who genuinely want to know God's word are limited and frustrated because it's never been helpfully enlightened to them. They've never learned how to read it or they've never had someone be able to answer their questions in a, in a way that's easy to understand. So there's somebody, there's those out there who desire it but are not being fed it. They want to be fed, right? It's kind of like a, a, a hamster at the, that water bottle is 
you know, trying to try. They want the water, right? And the hamster's there just chewing, but there's no, the bottle's empty, right? So they just can't get it. Well, one, you need, they need somebody to fill the bottle, help them. So sometimes it's that. Other times it's because people don't want to be pure. People don't care. If I, if I actually read it, then it means I know it. I was going to say, isn't part of it uh, because we have the Spirit, that's why we are a tree? Yes. It is, it, is a, it is an evidence found in 1 John that a desire and a hunger and a love for God's Word and His people is one of the evidences of genuine salvation. Like, it transforms you. God transforms you when He regenerates and converts you. You're transformed, and you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. And guess who breathed out the Scripture? The Holy Spirit. Yes. And so you have the author of the Holy Spirit indwelling you. Yeah, you're going to be interested yeah, you're going to want to know it. Now, you might need to find someone to help you know it. Or you might have to, to put some, some effort in there. But God will give wisdom of his word. Uh, James 1.5 tells us that he will give wisdom. And that's in the context of his word to all who ask for it freely. Yes. And so, but this is important. How can, don't you want to know how to, how to stay pure and how to fight against sin? Yeah. Well, you guard, it, you guard your heart according to, and your pure walk according to God's word. You live by God's word. You walk by God's word. You measure everything through God's word. That's what you do. We are people of the word. That's what we do. So and I'm, I, I'm, I'm always grateful when people are excited about God's word. And I think it's, it's easier to get excited when you begin to understand it. It, it, it would be the equivalent of if you lived overseas in a foreign country and you know none of the language and then you're there long enough and all of a sudden you're picking up on stuff and now you can understand a few things and how exciting that is, right? Because now you can, now you can partake. Now you can, there's so much more you can get out of everything. Well, that's the same idea here. You need to learn how to interpret the Bible, how to speak in the way that the one author who is God himself spoke so that you understand that author's intent and what he's really saying. And then it gets exciting because now you've got, you've got, oh, it's like a lightning bolt. Like, oh. And once you see that truth just open up like a flower, there's no going back. You get addicted, don't you? Good way kind of addicted. Question eight. What's verse 10 mean? With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandment. So what kind of, is this talking, let me ask you in, in this question here. Does verse 10 require effort? Yes. 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 It does. This is not just uh, sit on your Barker lounger and when your TV dinner is done, you, you finished eating your hungry man TV dinner, you're going to blissfully fall asleep, you're going to wake up, and God will have downloaded all of his word into your brain, and you are a walking, talking commentary. Is that how it works? No. 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 No, I wish. <laughs> Is that because the hungry man meal or the download sounds appealing? <laughs> and the bar lounger. I can taste that in my mouth. <laughs> can you? Is everybody getting like flashbacks right now? <laughs> Kid cuisine, no, yeah. What's that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The bar lounger. Yeah, it's like a lazy boy recliner. Every time you say that. Is that, a, no, is that a Minnesota term? Uh, I don't know. It's just like Davenport, Afghan, commode. I got it. My grandma used to call them all. Vacuum. My grandma always said commode. Commode. The commode. Go get the commode. Like we need to go to the bathroom. The throne. The throne. There was this. There was this. Uh, there was this place I lived in, and the the toilet. If you lift up the toilet lid on the bottom of it, it said church. And so the, the rule of thumb was, instead of saying, I'm going to the bathroom, I'm going to church. <laughs> now, that was before I was a believer. Now I would find that blasphemous. <laughs> but, oh, yeah. but that was before, yeah. And so I think it's better we just move on with verse 10. <laughs> with my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. So obviously, when we say whole heart, we remember back to what we've already talked about, about there's two different types of whole heart. There's the kind of whole heart we'll have in heaven which is a perfected wholeness. And then there's a whole heart as far as like, look, we are, we are utterly dependent upon God. And so the wholeness that we can seek after him with is not the same as the wholeness we'll, we'll have in heaven. This is, this is lesser than. 
but there's a way of, of seeking after him. So this, this requires effort to be able to do that. So when you seek after God, the idea is, is that this takes over your life, my whole life. It's, it's about God now, and it's about God's word. My whole heart, I seek after God. And where would I seek after God? In his word. word. You want to know God? You want to get closer to God? You, with what heart you have, right? Knowing that, that you are sinner and saint at the same time right now, right? Here on earth, you're sinner and saint. At the same time that you are perfectly saved and in the arms of Christ, you are saved, but at the same time, you still sin. So you have your spirit, which is saved, and your body, which is still sinful flesh. And so it won't be until heaven when that is removed. And so you're at the same time both sinner and saint. So you, can't, you can only seek after God so much when you're both sinner and saint, right? The idea here is, is that as much as you are able to, that that is what you are doing. That, that where you're at is what is desiring to seek after God with everything that you are at the moment that you're in. That that is what you seek him with everything that you are. That's your desire. That's how you've been changed. And in doing so, once you are living that way, then the second part of verse 10 says, let me not wander from your word. So that means I want to be like that and stay that way. I want to seek after you with everything I've got, with everything I can. I want to seek after you by seeking your word with everything I got and everything I can. And, Lord, help me not to wander from your word. I want to stay that way, and I want to stay in your word. I don't want to wander. What's it look like in, in, in today's day and age to practically wander from God's word? Let me give you an example. Um, uh, let's see. What would be a good example? Uh, I want to go and get wasted. I want to get wasted. I want to drink... Um, I'm a big fan of Dylan Mulvaney, and I'm going to drink 16, 24 packs of Bud Light, and I'm going to, I'm going to get wasted, right? Yeah. And somebody says, somebody says, well, you know, why are you doing that? Well, why not? Right? I, I don't see a reason why I can't. Bible doesn't forbid drinking. It just forbid, forbids getting drunk. And I'm pretty sure I can drink 16, 24 packs without getting drunk. <laughs> right yeah i'm glad you all agree that that's ridiculous okay if some if some I, i'm glad nobody was nodding going yeah yeah 16 24 packs so yeah that's a ridiculous number it's meant to be hyperbole right it's ridiculous the idea is is that why don't you do that well what does god's word say about that don't get drunk mm -hmm. you're going to get drunk if you do that so are you measuring your life and what you're doing in your everyday walk i mean everything through God's word. Are you doing that? Or are you wandering off and picking and choosing when you're going to refer to God's word and when you're not? That's what the psalmist is talking about. Don't let me wander from your commandments. Don't let me wander from your word is what that means. Commandments is, again, not just referring to the Ten Commandments. It's talking about all of God's word. Let me not wander from your word. It's, uh, you know, I really, you know, that show where those guys do all those funny jokes and, they, you know, yeah, they cuss and they swear and they use the Lord's name in vain and, and all those things. But, you know, it's the way I relax. There should be a pricking of your conscience that says something's not right. I know I shouldn't be doing this. And how do you know you shouldn't be doing this? Because God's word says that. It says no. TV show you like it's like, ah, oh, this is only one. Yeah, violence or adultery yeah, or. Just one word or something. Yes. Justify. Yes, because now this is how seriously that's to seek him with your whole heart. Okay? That you're taking every aspect of your life and you're saying, I am going to filter this through God's word, understanding that this is going to hurt. There will be some things that I must give up and say no to yeah. mm -hmm. when I do that. And there's many people, to kind of go back to what Kathy was talking about before, there's many people who are seeking the truth and don't know. And then in response to that, we said that there's people who don't want to know the truth because to know the truth means that I now have to deal with it. Yeah. And I'd rather be ignorant. I'd rather not know. I'd rather not know because then, oh sure, I'm sure that God's word tells me what's right and what's wrong. I just don't want to know it because then I know I'm in the wrong when I know I need to be in the right. 
And so I don't want to deal with that, so I'd rather not know. And so that's part of that too. That might have the spirit in him then. Right. That's going to be an unbeliever. That's just it. That, that would be an evidence where I would say, you know, enough of that. And you're starting to wonder the genuineness of someone's salvation. Enough times where they're saying, I don't care what God's word says. And people never genuinely speak that way, right? If you tell somebody like, well, you can't do that. Uh, you can't, you, you shouldn't go and get an abortion. Well, why not? Well, it says, you know, that God made everyone in his image and thou shalt not kill. And so... And that just happens to be one of the Ten Commandments. So I don't mean, you know, I'm saying anything in God's Word is a commandment, not just the Ten Commandments. Yes. But if that person says, well, I don't care what God's Word says. Well, That's what? Awesome. What do you mean you don't care? But they won't say it that way. They're like, well, I don't believe that part of the Bible. Well, what part do you believe? Right? And so there's lots of picking and choosing going on, and that's one of the easy ways for people to rationalize with themselves. Well, look, I'm still a believer, I still believe in most of the Bible. It's just the parts that offend me that I don't believe in, right? Or the parts that go against what I want to do that I don't believe in, right? Well, that's cherry-picking God's Word. Now, whose commandments are you following if you're doing that? Your own. Your own. You might be following some of God's, but you're also following some of your own. Is that being loyal to Him? No. no. Santa God. Santa God. There was a guy on Facebook, and he said... Heart. He's been watching The Chosen, and he really thinks it's good, but he's been studying Reformed uh, Church. Mm -hmm. And he said, apparently God is telling him that that's not biblical. And he said, should I keep watching it? And I said, no, it's not biblical. No, there's, there's lots of problems. I don't want this to turn into a discussion on The Chosen. Just know that the Chosen is non-biblical. Know that the Chosen is pro-Mormonism, uh, that they have um, several of the people involved, uh, not in the cast, but in the staff, supporting staff, are open homosexuals who are um, welcomed and not, uh, not being brought under conviction of God's word and called to repentance. Um, know that the person who plays Jesus, uh, which don't, I mean, don't even get me started with the, the, the fact that you shouldn't be playing Jesus, but the idea is, is that he is, and, and he is a practicing Catholic who prays to the dead and who has recently said that he had a nice long conversation uh, with a man named Lonnie, who was the one who was, uh, that he played in the, uh, what was that show that was just out in the movie theaters that everybody loved? It was the one talking about the Jesus culture. Uh, Lonnie Frisbee, who's in the Jesus culture, he died a, a practicing homosexual, died from AIDS, a practicing homosexual, uh, who claimed to be a prophet and speak for God. And so he's the actor who played both him in Jesus culture and who plays Jesus in The Chosen. He is a practicing Roman Catholic who prays to the dead and who says that he spoke to Lonnie Frisbee regarding everything that was going on. Okay. Major warning flag, red flags all over that show. Not only that, but the fact that it does not keep to Scripture accurately. No. And I saw so. yesterday also when they got out that somebody put on the guy that plays John the Baptist. This is his profile picture. And it was a satanic goat type thing. Yeah, I think that the easiest thing, if you're interested in that, uh, there's plenty of good... Um, Good godly men who have put out videos on what's wrong with the chosen. I would, in, you know, encourage you guys to look at that. Maybe I'll well, try and put links in the show description. We watched. We were, I looked at him, and he looked at me, and I went, "This is biblical." I mean, I feel like I was watching Johnny Carson. He walked out between this big curtain to the five thousand, and I'm like, "They didn't have a curtain. They didn't have anything." Uh oh, yeah, he just walked out on that stage like zealous. I can't sit. Yeah. Did, did somebody did somebody come running up like James Brown and put a cloak over him? <laughs> yeah. Something like that. All right, so just to finish up on verse 10, with my whole heart I seek you, let me not wander from your commandments or wander from your word. Make sense? We went through that. All right, question nine. What does verse 11 mean, and how does it connect to verse nine? So question nine is talking about verse 11 and verse nine. So what does verse 11 mean? Verse 11 says, I have stored up your word in my heart so that... I might not what? Okay, pretty, pretty straightforward there, isn't it? I need to follow your directions, God. I have stored up your word. I have stored up your directions 
your commands, your statutes, your precepts. I've stored all that up in my heart, in the innermost me. It's not just something that is um, post-it noted on the outside of my forehead. It is not something that I keep in my sock. It is something that I've put stored, I've put to keep. You store something that you has value and that you want to keep and that you want to go back to and use. So I have stored your word. I've stored it where? In my heart, in the deepest part of me. So that I might not do what? Sin so I might not sin against you. I find that against there very powerful. Mm-hmm. You know, to sin more like to sin. This is saying to sin against God. Yes, it's a, so it's a reminder like what yes. we saw in Psalm 51 that who have I sinned against in heaven, Lord, but you. When all sin is against God, all of it, all of it. So this is a reminder of that. And verse 9 says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to his word. And verse 11, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against God. You, I love the pointing out of against who? Against God. It's not just sin. It does kind of cheapen it a little bit, lessen it a little bit, if you just say the term sin. But if you say sin against God, sin against a holy God, sin against a righteous God, ooh, it adds weight. It certainly does. So, how do you see those working in your life? Is that what you do? Do you store up God's word? Do you use that as a tool against sin? You might use it for encouragement. I could say, I have stored up your word in my heart so that I might not be discouraged. I could say, I've stored up your word in my heart so that I might not be afraid. I could say, I've stored up your word in my heart so that I might be able to uh, rest in the knowledge of your salvation. I might be able to say lots of things. And many of us use God's word in that way to combat fear, anxiety, to be encouraged, to find strength, to find hope, right? This is also how you use God's word, to combat sin. So it's real. a lot of people love devotionals, and most devotionals that I see are, are more about encouragement, fear, worry, anxiety, all those different things, right? Rather than, you know, here's what God's word says about this sin. Here's what God's word says about that sin. Here's what yeah. God's word says about this other sin. Now, worry and anxiety and fear can be sinful, can be sins of themselves because it's a distrust of God. But the idea is, is that I have stored up your word in my heart for the very reason of not sinning against you. So it ties into verse 9 because at verse 9 and verse 11 are both telling us if I want to fight sin and I want to sin less, then I need to know God's word, keep God's word, store it up, be able to have it readily available to use so that I might not sin against God. Does that make sense? Is that encouraging to know? Like, you've got the the weapon now. Um, That's what you use. Uh, It does not say, I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Oh, and by the way, I also have willpower. (laughs) It doesn't say that doesn't say, I have a support group or anything like that. No, the, the vital tool that's used to fight against sin is God's word. All right, question 10. What is the psalmist asking in verse 12? He says, blessed are you, O Lord. So he starts out by blessing the Lord. But then the ask comes right after that. So everything he set up until this point is, makes him say, Lord, you're so blessed. Blessed are you. You're so amazing. You're so awesome. Teach me your statutes. Um, Be my teacher. Teach me your statutes. What's another way of saying the exact same thing? Teach me your word. Help me understand your word. So is it okay to ask God? If you say, I really want to know God's word, but I have a hard time understanding it. Is it okay to ask God yes. for his help yes. in order to be taught? Who, yes. who breathed out God's word? God. God. Who better to ask than the author? God. God. Yeah. Exactly. Well, God is the author. So who better to ask than God? Nobody. Yeah. He's the author. So, of course, going to him is the, is the best option. And so that's what we do. 
we realize all these things are just so, Lord, you're just so blessed and are so blessing. Teach me your word. Teach me your statutes. Question 11. What does verse 13 mean and what does it look like in real life? Verse 13 says, With my lips I declare all the rules of, my, of your mouth. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. That's verse 13. What's that, what's that mean, first of all? With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. Sharing. Sharing what? Sharing his word. His word. So the rules of God's mouth is just another way of saying his word, of saying the Bible, of saying his statutes, his precepts, his commands. So if I say uh, my favorite thing to read is the rules of God's mouth, you know that I'm talking about the Bible. I'm talking about scripture. With my lips, I declare scripture. With my lips, I declare all the rules or all the things that are contained within God's word so the idea here is what's that what's that look like in real life with my lips i declare all the rules or all the things that are in god's word what's that look like in real life what can that look like in real life what do i do every sunday what do i do every sunday besides go to church yes when i get to church preach right preaching and yeah, what do I do? You preach and teach, right? So that could be a form of with my lips, I declare all the rules of his mouth. With my lips, I declare what God's word says. So it can be preaching, it can be teaching uh, from, a, from a pastoral standpoint. But you don't have to be a pastor to be able to do this, do you? No. no. So what's it look like for somebody who's not a pastor? Evangelizing to your friends and family. Evangelizing to your friends and family. Sharing the gospel. Sharing the gospel. Even sharing God's word to another believer. Right? The stirring up of love and good works. Hey, um, I know that your goldfish died and that you're very broken up about it. And, uh, you know, who knew that goldfish didn't like uh, garbage disposals? I feel really bad about that. And I can tell you're busted up about it, but remember Revelation 21 4. There'll be no more tears, no more sorrow, no more. No sorrow. Yeah. <laughs> So the idea would be you can use scripture and with your lips declare scripture to people in different situations, even other believers. Yes to the gospel. Yes to friends and family and evangelizing. But also yes to what is it you're going through? Oh, here's what God's word says about that. You can do, that's most powerful, not just in evangelizing and in gospel, but also most powerful for in the lives of believers. And that goes back to that encouragement and also to rebuking and to correction, right? Hey, you can't do that. Um, how many wives do you have? Four. You can't do that. What are you thinking? First off, why? <laughs> yeah. That's my first thing. Thank you for saying that. I, <laughs> I always think that when, oh, Solomon and all his wives and all that. Why? Yeah. You poor fool. <laughs> really? <laughs> One is, one, is the way, one is the way, right? One is the way. That's the way God ordained, right, is one. So even though, even though you have uh, these kings who, who have all these multiple wives and stuff, they did not obey God. That was not God's will for them. That, that was not God's word to do that. And so they suffered because of that. So, I mean, those are just examples of how you take God's word and use it with your lips declaring God's word. It can be in just the, the simplest of terms. Hey, my, my nephew uh, thinks he's transgender. What, where do I go in Scripture? What, what do I do? What do you think a good pastor is going to tell you? He's going to point you to Scripture, to, to multiple Scriptures that will help you in that, to identify it as it is, and to, to point in the direction of this is what it is, it's sin, and this is how um, you get through that. And how you counter that is with the gospel. Make sense? Yes. So that's what it looks like in real life. Question 12. How does the psalmist feel about God's word in verse 14? He says, In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. So God's testimony is God's word. If you say, come on in, I need to get your testimony, you're getting my word. 
right? And so this is just another way of describing God's word. So he says, in the way of your word, in the way of your testimonies, he does what? He de delights. delights. He delights in it. And not only does he delight in it, it's not like, oh, you know, I delight in it like a peanut butter parfait on a hot day. He's, he's not just delighting in it in that kind of lower sense. He's delighting in it and compares it to as much as what? Riches. All riches, right? That's a pretty high way of talking about God's word. He values it as if it's all riches. Wow, right? I mean, that's a pretty high value. He says, as much as in all riches. Take all the riches of the earth, and that's how I value your word. Oh. Now, do you value scripture that way? If somebody said, uh, I'll give you $20 billion of the word of God. You can have God's word, the Bible, or you can have $20 billion. And if you choose the $20 billion, you don't get any of God's word at all. You'll never know it. You'll never be exposed to it. You won't be able to do anything with it. Yeah, you wouldn't want that deal, right? As tempting as it might be for those of us who live paycheck to paycheck. But uh, do you value Scripture that way? That you see it as that valuable? It's that valuable? So my, my question is, if you do, if you really see it that valuable, and this is a, a question you don't answer aloud, you ask yourself this question when you're sitting alone quiet with the Lord later. You say, if I really do value your word like that, like it really is that more valuable than all the riches in the world, am I really living that way? Am I really living that way? If I value it that way, if, you, you know, if I'm forced to say, I'm like, yeah, I do, but, but am I actually practically, does my life bear that out? Does it show that? If someone who doesn't know me was to take a, uh, let's say there's a, uh, a History Channel crew, I mean, they'll record anything. A History Channel crew, and they follow you for the entire day, right? Nobody knows who you are. They don't know anything about you, but a History Channel crew follows you for the entire day, and then they play that entire day on uh, the TV. Do the people watching that one episode of that one day in your life, do they believe that you value God's Word as highly as you think you do? That's a question for self meditation later when you're alone with the Lord. And if you don't, none of us do, then how can you change that? It's like what we were just talking about, not only with the prayer praying, but also, like you said, staying focused on the Word mm -hmm. itself. Yeah, being in the Word itself, being around the Word, talking to other people who are around the Word. If everybody I hang out with are all into uh, uh, Cleveland Guardians and Def Leppard, and that's all they talk about. Everybody I talk, about, talk to, all my friends, Def Leppard and Cleveland Guardian fans, that's all they talk about. Well, what am I going to be tempted to focus on? Well, that's what I, I said, what am I be tempted to focus on? All my friends are Def Leppard fans and Cleveland Guardians. So what am I going to be tempted to think about? Def Leppard, Def Leppard and Guardians. Yeah. So, so if, if that's the case... Then even that, even the choice of my friends, the shows I'm watching, the books I'm reading, the programs I'm listening to, all of that is a way to affect whether or not I am staying focused on God's word. If I'm, st if I'm seeking after him with my whole heart or if I'm giving him 20%. I give him enough to quiet my conscience and then when it starts to bother me again, when I'm dipping my toe in the rest of the world or I need him, then I'll up that 20%. And then when things are good again, back from 80 down to 20 again, or maybe 30, right? We need to, to guard against that kind of thinking. And so it does, matter, uh, it does matter how you feel about God's word. And your life will show what you really think of God's word. How you live shows what you really believe. So think about that. That's a good way of, you know, you have to, you have to take a self-inventory sometimes and be like, I... I do believe in you, Jesus. I do believe that you're my righteousness. I do believe that, that, that you are the Son of God, that you came, lived a perfect life, died, rose again, are in heaven and are coming back. I believe in everything your word says. Have mercy on me and help me, for I am so wicked that in spite of all these things, I am a hypocrite, and I do not love you the way I should. And I do not, I do not find myself in love with your word as I should.
change me, help me. That's what the psalmist is doing here. He's not afraid to pray for that. All right, question 13. What does verse 15 mean? And what does it look like when done in our own lives? I will meditate. Here's the answer to what we were just talking about, right? I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. Boy, that fits in nicely to everything we were just saying. So what's that mean? I'm going to meditate on your precepts is another way of saying I will think. I will contemplate. I will think on your precepts is another word for what? Laws, Laws. Laws which is another word for? Thank you. <laughs> yes, God's word. So I will think on, dwell on, meditate, contemplate on your word. And there's an and here. He's not just going to do that. He's not just going to sit and, and stroke his beard and say, I, yes, mm, God's word, yes. Mm, mm. He's going to do something else. And I'm going to do what? I'm going to fix my eyes on your ways. You do what you're looking at, right? You go where you're looking. You walk where you're looking. You drive where you're looking. You do what you're looking at. So fix your eyes not on this world, but on God's word, which is how you know. How do you know God's ways? It's in his word. word. So he says, I'm going to meditate on your word. I'm going to meditate on your precepts. I'm going to think on your word. And I'm going to fix my eyes on your word, which is, or your ways, which is found in your word. What's that look like? in our lives today. If what's it look like to meditate on his precepts, to, to think on his word, and to fix your eyes on his ways? What's that look like? I would say it's like what James was talking about. If you truly believe, you're going to be walking and doing what God wants you to do. You'll be acting correctly. You'll be keeping the law. And people will be able to see it. Yeah, and you'll be seeking to do it. Right. Yes. If you're not successful and do it, you're you're in the you're seeking to be. Yes. So it's not so much perfection as it is direction. Yes. Exactly. So your direction will be seeking God's word and seeking to live it out. Yeah, very good. I like that. Any other examples of what that looks like when done in our own lives? You're doing it right now. One example. You're at a Bible study. You don't have to be here. You could be home watching Arthur on TV. You could be home. You could you could you could be home making tie dye t shirts in the backyard, right? You could be doing lots of things right now, but here you are listening to me talk about God's word. So that's one way, right? One way to meditate on God's word, which is His precepts. One way to meditate on God's word is to do a Bible study, to study His word on your own and with others. That's one way. And then that helps you. The more you learn God's word, the, the easier it is to fix your eyes on his ways and then walk in them. Yes. That's how you grow. That's how you're sanctified is, is in and through God's word. That's how the Holy Spirit does it. You don't just wake up one day and be like, oh, sanctification, I get it. <laughs> like, you don't, yeah. you know, oh. you're, you're, not, you're never sitting in the drive-thru of Burger King and all of a sudden out of nowhere a lightning bolt shots, shoots through your, your brain and you're like, wait a minute, justification, I get it. Mm -hmm. No, you've, you've had to have been in God's word for him to reveal it to you, yes. right? And how exciting is it when the light bulb goes off? Oh. We have all had that excitement, which is one of the reasons... Uh, or one of the ways that God draws his people to have that hunger and that thirst for his word. Any other examples of what it looks like when done in our own lives? We've talked about Bible studies. We've talked about a few other things. Any other thoughts? Is this something that should be a passing fancy, or is it something that should be done frequently? Frequently. Frequently. Yeah. Absolutely. On the other hand, it's like being a believer, you're not going you, to be able to help yourself on top of it. Mm -hmm. Even if you are walking, you're going to be like, God will bring you exactly. to a place. So let's say, to use your terminology, you're bucking God like a bronco. You're like, eh, I know, I should, yeah, eh, right, you're doing that. Well, what, what, does, what does a loving God, a loving Heavenly Father do, just like a loving parent does, when, when their kid is out of line? He corrects them. Mm -hmm. And so God does that too. And so he will correct you. And sometimes it's a gentle rebuke, and other times it's a harsh rebuke. But he will correct you and he will bring you to the place where you know now all of a sudden you are all about the things of God because you've been 
you've been rebuked, you've been uh, reproved, and now you, you say, okay, I, I, have, I have sinned, right? And that's where repentance, come, repentance comes in. An agreeing of God, with God, on what he says in his word. Yes, I am this. Yes, I have done wrong against what your word says, God. I repent. I change my mind. I change my actions. Please help me. What about question 14? I've been rebuked quite a few times, actually. Yeah, by the Lord? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is it pleasant at the time? No. No. Is it ever pleasant at the time? It's in your heart that you're, you know, you can't. You can't escape it. No. Because it's in your heart, so it's with you everywhere. In the same way, you know, God's mercy, grace, love, and his word is also in there. So it's not that the only thing that you carry with you 24-7, 365 is, is that rebuke feeling, right? When you finally relent and give in, right, that rebuke feeling dissipates and the other feelings take over. I see no one else says anything about being rebuked. <laughs> 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 I guess I'm uh, Bob, I think you're rebuking everybody right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get for saying yes when I said I was getting 20 years in prison. <laughs> I wasn't rebuked. <laughs> you <laughs> so that's what we do. Sometimes we need that, though. Like a, a good rebuke every once in a while, a gentle rebuke to a brother or a sister in the Lord who's, who's going the wrong way, who's doing the wrong thing. I'm not looking at anybody in particular. Okay. Just staring at my computer, <laughs> making sure nobody comes up to me afterwards and says, "Are were you rebuking me for this?" One? <laughs> yeah, why are you looking at me? Question fourteen. Thank you for sharing that, Bob. By the way, maybe that will give others courage to share things as well in the future. Question fourteen. Where does the psalmist find delight? According to verse sixteen, I will delight in your, which is another word for, word. yes. I think you guys got it. And then because of that, because he will delight in God's word and his statutes, what does the psalmist promise at the end of the verse? He says, I will not I will not forget your word. Very good. I won't forget it. Because it is so value to, valuable to me, and because I delight in it so much, I'm not going to forget it. Right? I'm not going to forget that it's there. I'm not going to act like it doesn't exist because I delight in it. That would be the natural response, right? If you tell me that you delight in Hershey Kisses and there's a bowl of Hershey Kisses in the church and you, every time you come in, you ignore it. And you never touch the bowl of Hershey Kisses. I'm going to wonder if you really delight in Hershey Kisses. But if every time you say, oh, I thank the Lord for Hershey Kisses, I just delight in them so much. And then you say that to me or you, you, you know, give, give praise for God for that. And uh, you come in every day at church and you grab a fistful of those. Well, now I'm going to believe that you delight in Hershey Kisses. Yeah. This is not an encouragement to dump out the candy tray at church. Not if you knew how many mouse, mice are over there. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, this one. It has nothing to do. I don't know where she, she's got mice on the brain. I guess. Yeah, because they get into that bowl. No, they don't. Anyway, this is why I don't like. Them. So, so I'll use a different example since that one's been ruined. That one's been ruined. No, I can't use anything food related. Can't use anything food related at all. Let, let's say that uh, what can I use? let's say that you say you hate mice you hate mice you hate rats and uh, you, you just want nothing to do with them and uh, and let's say that that a place that you um, frequent has a bunch of, of mice and rats and you say but I hate them I hate them and you go on and on about how much you hate them every time you know you're around me that's what you're telling me but then you never do anything you never put down any kind of you never call Orkin you never put down any kind of mouse traps or rat traps. You never put any decon down. You never do any of that, right? But you want me to believe that you hate mice and rats, but you're never doing anything about the mice and rats, right? I'm going to doubt that you, you say, oh, I delight in not having mice and rats. But if you never do anything about it, I'm going to doubt that you really delight in that. We delight I liked in my... not having ants anymore. <laughs> because we call this is turned into an Orkin promotion. I'm going to have to see if they'll sponsor the video. Like, hey, do you have 
But does that make sense? If you delight in something, it's going to be shown in your life, in your everyday life. You, it will be shown. And it'll show that you don't forget it. If you delight in Hershey Kisses, which was a way better example, if you delight in Hershey Kisses, it's going to show because every time you see a Hershey's Kiss, you're going to grab one, right? If you delight in God's Word, it's going to show because you won't forget God's Word, and it's going to be something that you focus on all the time. So you talk to some regular uh, yes. People have no idea how difficult this is. I like Hershey Kisses. Question, question 15. Last one. How would you describe your relationship or your feelings about God's word? What do you delight in within its pages? How do you meditate on it? How do you make sure not to forget it? So how would you, straight up answer, right? How would, just for the first part, how would you describe your relationship or your feelings about God's word? Would you say delight in it? What, what word comes to mind when I say, how do you feel about God's word? Love. Love. What? Intrigued. Intrigued. Love. Comforted. Comforted. Powerful. Powerful. Learn, learning. Comforted. Learning. Mm -hmm. Truth. When I say truth, I think of like source of truth. Mm -hmm. Any other words on what you think of when I say, how do you feel about God's word? Awesome. I like that one. I'd be more like Kathy, probably. Comforter. Comforter. It Comforter. depends on what stage I'm in and sure. what day it is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so would you say that, that if we go to the next question, what do you delight in within its pages, would that answer link to what you just said? Powerful, awesome, yes. comforter. Yes. Yeah. So it links. So what you delight in the most is those things about his word. Now, knowing that, how do you meditate on it? What do you do to spend time in God's Word or thinking about God's Word? Besides the Bible study. You all get brownie points for Bible study. Reading your Bible. Reading your Bible at home, right? Not while you're driving. Quite frequently, that's been happening. That's, I'm reading Jeremiah, and I mm -hmm. put it away, and then I get it back out, and I think, okay, what's going to happen today? <laughs> It's almost like a tune in next time. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. Yeah, so you can, there's lots of ways you can do this, right? You can read your Bible at home. You can read your Bible in your quiet time. I know a lot of people who like their smartphones or their tablets and reading the Bible there. Uh, devotions, um, commentaries, um, listening to uh, well done sermons on God's Word where you're getting exposition of God's word along with the reading of God's word. Lots of different ways of doing it. We have more ways to do it today than ever before. So really, uh, no excuse. Yeah. And would you say that, that true or false, uh, no time in God's word is ever wasted? True. 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 So if you believe that, then you know. That hey, instead of uh, instead of crushing candy, I'm gonna I'm gonna read a chapter in God's Word, right? Candy Crush. That was a reference to. A, oh, okay. Yeah. I did. I was actually I'll, thinking of candy. I'll, 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 I can eat candy. I'm almost finished. Yeah. 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 Yeah talking about it with other believers, right? Sharing God's word with other people, be they believers or non-believers. Very good. What did you guys think about part one and only part one of Psalm 119? Yay.